Hi, hi everyone. We have a guy today on the circuit. Um, you know, we in the community, we, we cater for everybody. And after coming to this country, this is a gentleman I appreciate having on because um, it gives us the full Canadian experience and he fit him well in the community. And I think for anybody internationally, wherever, you'll realize this is the type of luxury and the type of friendship and thing we develop here in Canada when we come to this country. So, so I don't want to sell too much out. I'll just ask you to introduce yourself and give us a little of your background. I know it's extensive, but we'll try to see how we can be timely and, and make this fun. My name is Tom Kuzmanis. Uh, Alderman, thank you for you know having me here on your program. It's a it's a you know it's a delight to be here. Um, you know I've known you for a long time uh, over the years, and um, you know to have me on the program it's uh, very special, especially with the topics that we're going to be talking about today. Um, you know they they are very close to to my heart, and and you know and it's got that um, you know that identity as well with the with the Caribbean community, which, uh, you know, which is, um, which is great. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be on the show and, um, you know, you can let me know when you want me to begin in terms of uh, well, well, talking well, a little bit about begin. myself. Where I want you to begin is um, seeing that you make the Canadian national team. This is a national or uh, former national Canadian national player here and Canada is doing great things and, it's a tribute to these guys who came before the squad that's made it to Qatar. Um, for the young people, how you make it? Was this a passion of yours? Did you pick it up from school? Um, you know, how, how, how you got into the sport? I, I, I literally got into the sport from, well, obviously my, my dad was a very good player back in his days. Um, so he, he used to play in the, uh, in the uh, NSL, uh, men's, professional back then he was also a former player for Toronto City when Mr. Steve Stavro had owned the team and and brought the likes of you know Johnny Banchflower and Sir Stanley Matthews over here uh, so my dad was around the circuit back in his days he was a top scorer uh, when he would play for uh, you know the various um, you know uh, you know teams uh, in his time period the Macedonian teams as you know some of the Greek teams and, and so on um, and, and that just kind of carried over to uh, myself and, and my brother um, when we were growing up. I actually had had played hockey as well for uh, a few seasons, and I was I was doing the hockey and soccer. And then um, you know a little you know neck injury or throat injury occurred in one of the hockey games. My parents panicked, and then they decided you're just going to be doing the soccer. Um, and I was a little bit disappointed about that, but I there. ended up. Hold on there. Were you that good in the, the you see? I was a good hockey player. I was, I, I, I was young. I was, you know, I was only around like eight or nine years old, uh, but I was a good hockey player. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, my parents, they just, you know, they got scared, you know, again, they were immigrant parents, you know, my, my dad had lived here. He came here when he was two years old, but my mom came here when she was 15. I asked him from where you, they came. Oh, they came from, so they came from Northern Greece. Um, so they're from the, the, the Northern, Macedon, uh, Northern Macedonia on, um, on the Greek side. Um, so they, yeah, they came from that, that area. And, um, you know, and they decided that I was going to uh, then play soccer. Um, they just got scared of the fact that I got injured. And they didn't really love the uh, the rough and tough going of, of hockey. And and I actually still wanted to continue. But, you know, I was young. My parents made the choice for me at that time. And we stuck with uh, soccer. And so I, I basically started my initial years uh, in growing up with playing with Agent Court Soccer Club. Um, so I was playing house league my very first year, house league soccer. I was eight years old and I was playing U12 and I only had played eight games. Um, I had scored something to the tune of like 44, 45 goals, somewhere there in the eight games. And 
we won the championship and all that stuff. And the coach, he was, I can't remember the coach's name. He was an Italian man, older man. And he basically uh, had communicated to my dad saying, we don't want your son here. That's pretty much what he summed it up. And my dad didn't really understand what he meant by that. And he said, no, no, no. What we mean is he cannot be playing house league. He needs to play rep soccer. So, um, so what they did is they basically uh, lined us up to go play rep. And I ended up playing rep soccer my first year with Agent Court Soccer Club um, under the helm of, of uh, Alan Hosey. Um, okay. And so Alan Hosey was my first um, rep coach when I started playing soccer. Um, I had played with Agent Court Soccer Club for a few seasons. Then I moved over. Uh, at that point, and went to Wexford Soccer Club. And Tom Croft was my coach, um, and I was with them. Um, we had won uh, many championships. We were the top team at that time in Ontario. We won the Ontario Cups. Um, and then I ended up um, moving again uh, at that point over to Scarborough Maple Leaf. And then we basically formed the dynasty of that Maple Leaf team. Uh, you know, we won four Ontario Cups. Uh, over the years, any, um, any just won literally everything. But um, at the time, I was playing with uh, Fitzroy Powell, um, Brent Martin. Um, so, you know, those are the guys in my age group. Um, man, there's there's more. I, I, I've just got to remember some of the names. But they were, you know, with um, with Malvern at the time. Um, so how this scouting report got out on you? Where about... Um because you, you you hit the national where before that do you think this scout the scouting is just like how the guy from the house league said you know we don't need your kid here there's somewhere yeah. in there where the report would start to go ahead of you it's like well i i i think just over the years with the club teams that i play i played on and and us being the the top team and uh, you know, and me being, you know, the the score on the team and so on just led to all of that. Um, and, you know, f- with us always winning the Ontario Cups, us winning national championships, you know, that exposure started to come around where it was like, not only is this team incredible, but there's a guy up top who can score all these goals. And all of a sudden, you know, my name was starting to, you know, just you know, become a, um, you know, a, a name around, not just in Scarborough, but, you know, throughout the province and, you know, even throughout the country, you know, when we would travel to the nationals or I was a part of the provincial uh, select teams, you know, we would play the other provinces. And, you know, as we know, all, you know, Ontario has always been one of the stronger teams when we compete. And then all of a sudden, you know, they, they see this face and they see that face and they're like, oh, geez, you know, like we've got our hands cut here, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it just went from from there. And, you know, and, you know, there's an interesting story to that all uh, as well, because, um, you know, my pathway is similar to like a lot of kids pathways uh, in today's game where, you know, we, we start out with, you know, the provincial selects and we make the provincial selects team. And then from there. You know, you go to the national championships representing your province and then, you know, the national coaches are there to see and then they start selecting players. And when I was a part of the under 16 um, national training center, um, I actually was cut from the uh, national team initially. And I know that you're, 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 yeah, I, I see your gesture there. <laughs> yeah, it was okay. a shock to me as well. It was a shock to me as well. And I know there's a lot of, people who will be watching this who will um, who will attest to this and they've heard this so many times and we hear this in the game um, you know the reason where they had initially cut me was they said you know, you're not big enough you know um, oh and and I was there saying to myself wow you know they're gonna kind of play what, that what card can I ask what year that was around what that year, year that yeah so that year would have been around 1988 uh, Eight, around there, around 1988, uh, around the summertime. So, um, and a buddy of mine um, who played with us on Scarborough Maple Leaf, uh, Chris Fermanis, he had made the team. So, um, and we were obviously good friends 
playing club soccer at Maple Leaf. And I'll never forget this. He, he had actually called me from, um, from Colorado. Uh, at that time, the, the under-16 national team was playing two exhibition games against the U.S. team uh, in Colorado Springs. And he basically called me up, and he was just livid. And he said, we need you to be on this team. I don't know uh, how you're feeling at this moment, but you need to do whatever you need to do to get back on this team. We need you. And I, and I basically told him, I said, hey, I'm not the one who makes the decisions, and, you know, and we'll go from there. You know? And it just so ironic enough, it happened that summer where uh, Ray Clark, who um, was the provincial under-17 coach at that time, had invited me to come to his team to play for the under-17 provincial team. And I'll never forget this conversation because when the phone rang, I was upstairs and my dad had answered the phone, you know, and, and I was hearing from the top of the stairs kind of like what the conversation was all about. And all I remember my dad saying to Ray Clark was, Ray, I understand what you're saying, but you are asking my son to come and try out and be a part of an under 17 provincial team that had a lot of players on the previous under 16 national team that played here in Toronto for the under 16 world cup. So how do you expect my son to make that provincial team with lots of national team players when my son couldn't make it on his own national team? And Ray Clark bluntly told my dad, because my dad told me afterwards, I didn't hear everything that he was saying to my dad, obviously. And he told my dad straight out, I think they made a really bad mistake. And he goes, so I think that if he's surrounded with the right personnel, um, he's under my wing and he comes out with kind of, you know, um, you know, he just with some, you know, um, excitement and emotion, a little bit of fire, you know, a fire in him that um, that uh, I'll make sure that he'll get back on that national team. And I went to that team and I'll never forget this. We were in, Sa- uh, in, Sas- in Saskatoon playing at the under 17 national championships. And um, I was playing as a winger. And at the end of the tournament, um, I ended up being uh, the second highest, I guess you can say uh, goal scorer in terms of goals. Mm -hmm. Um, But actually I had, if you're going to account assists, which they didn't do back then, I was actually the top scorer in the entire tournament. So the under 19 national team basically said, we want to invite Tom and the rest of these players to a little mini camp that they were having in Saskatoon with the players that kind of opened their eyes. Um, At that time. But ironically enough, because there were a lot of um, players from the under 16 national team who were also playing at this tournament, Mm -hmm. they also had a little mini camp for the under 16 national team. So here I was cut from this initial under 16 national team, and I had both coaches basically fighting over which camp is Tom going to go to now. And um, I ended up staying actually for the under uh, 19 camp uh, at that point. Yeah. And it, and it basically cemented my spot on the national team. So I'll never forget this. I had a conversation with Gary Miller at the time. He was the assistant coach and Gary brought me in and basically said to me after what you just did this weekend, um, we're not telling you um, that you have a chance to make our under 60 national team. We're basically telling you, that you're on the team. And they asked me at that time, you know, how would you feel about playing left back? And it kind of threw me. Yeah. It kind of threw me as a surprise. And, and, uh, in the, I was there thinking to myself, man, you know, I, I'm, I'm always been a goal scorer. I've been scoring my entire life. I just did something that was just, you know, out of this world at this tournament and now you're asking me to play left back on the national team. And, you know, I, I, I took it, I took it with a grain of salt, but I also took it in a positive light where the senior national team now. No, it was the under 19 national, national team. team. Okay. So I, which is now the U twenties as they call it. Okay. Um, so I, I basically, um, you know, I, I took it with a grain of salt. Um, but at that time, 
I, I just wanted to be a really a good sport about it. I didn't want to show any type of attitude. You know, I just wanted to embrace it. And I basically had told Gary Miller, if this, if this is what it takes for me to be on this team, then I will, I will take on that role in that position. Okay. And it was from that point on, um, I will never forget it. I, I obviously I went to all the tours and the camps and then we had qualified uh, for the uh, under 16 um, World Cup, which was held in Scotland. By the way, that qualifying tournament, if we're going to add the, the Caribbean flair to all of this, mm-hmm. the actual CONCACAF qualification was in Trinidad and Tobago that year, the entire tournament. So uh, it was three spots that were, uh, you know, that were uh, there to be mm-hmm. taken. And so it was um, us, the Americans, and Cuba who happened to qualify for that under-16 World Cup. And what happened? How did, was it from the Montreal team? No. So basically what happened was um, after I had torn my ACL, this was, um, you know, after um, the, the first time I tore my ACL. So this was, this was um, in the time period when I was with the Canadian Olympic team. So let's actually even rewind that beforehand because – with the under um, 19 uh, or the under 20, as they call it now, but the under 19 national team, we had played against Trinidad and Tobago in Guatemala for the U20 uh, World Cup qualifications. And we had played against Dwight York uh, with that team. And if you recall, Aldwin, that Trinidad and Tobago team had a very successful run in the under 20 World Cup that's what created that whole attention for Dwight York and, and going overseas and, and that particular team. So I already had played against Dwight York um, at that time. Now I was playing as a, as a winger, so we never matched up. But then when I got to the Canadian Olympic team, um, I was um, a left fullback uh, at that time. Uh, the game in Toronto, uh, sorry, the game in Barn- Barnaby, BC, he was not there to play in that game. But when we had the return leg playing uh, back in Trinidad and Tobago, um, that was the, the match where we had beaten them uh, 3-1. And the whole situation at the, at, you know, on the beach party and all of that. So I already had my exposure of being around Dwight York. So now fast forward. Um, so in 94, um, I was on trial with uh, Glasgow Rangers and with Aston Villa. So uh, at the time when I went to Aston Villa and I had arrived at the... Well, for the young people, the how did you get that offer? Did you get it from your club team or from the national or your parents made that move? Or how, how? Okay, so that move actually came from um, through, through the representatives that I had at that point, um, Gordon Hill, who was a former Manchester United great and had played with um, Manchester United back in the seventies and and played for England. Um, So at the time he was our coach with the Nova Scotia Clippers. Um, And at the time when they had drafted me, um, Gordon wasn't a part of the, the, the the draft. It was the the management for the organization. So when I had arrived, um, he had contacted me and he basically said, you know, we're, where, um, you know, I've heard a lot about you and yeah, I've seen some tapes on you, but I need to see you myself, you know? So he goes, when you arrive in Nova Scotia, when you play with us, I'm going to get to see you, um, you know, up close and personal. And so when I actually joined the team, um, we were already on the road at that time and they had already played the first seven games of the season without me because I was still finishing high school at that time. And so I had joined the team on the road in Winnipeg uh, to play the Winnipeg Fury. And then we had played against the Vancouver 86ers, um, you know, a few nights later. And at that time, that match was, was pegged as the, as the two undefeated teams in the Canadian Soccer League. And so here we were playing at Swan Guard Stadium against the mighty Vancouver 86ers back then. And um, we ended up losing the match 3-1. I ended up scoring the lone goal for the Clippers. I had a, I had a good match. So what ended up happening was on the way home now, um, the very next morning, I, 
I was asked to come to the office. And Gordon Hill at the time, now I'm telling you the Man United story. So at the time, Gordon Hill um, had invited me to the office and it was actually our player coach, Mickey Lyons, um, who started the conversation off by basically saying, um, we heard a lot about you. We've seen two games uh, already uh, up close and personal with you. And that's all we need to see. And so Mickey Lyons was trying to sell the pitch on me that at that time, he was also the, the skipper at, um, at Wigan. So, and Wigan at that time was a division three club. So he was basically making the proposal of your left-sided player, left-sided players are, are needed, um, you know, around the world type of thing. And so this is going to be an opportunity where we can take you to Wigan. You play there maybe for about six months or a year. We sell you and then Wigan makes their money. Nova Scotia makes their money. You're off to your, you know, bigger and better. And that's what we can do. Gordon, on the other hand, had a different plan. He was like, you're not going to go division three. So actually Mickey Lyons, after he made that pitch to me, he left the, the meeting and uh, it was just a one-on-one -on -one personal meeting with Gordon Hill. And Gordon Hill said, no, 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 we're, we're not going to do that. He goes, um, if you play division three, you know, a young kid like you coming in, they're going to like look to just massacre you there. You know, you have former pros that are dropping down. You have a lot of young players who are trying to make their way up. He goes, you're going to get killed in that league. They're going to break your legs. That's essentially what he said. He goes, they're, they're going to break your legs there. So what ended up happening was um, Gordon said, you know, I'm, I'm looking at sending you to Man United right away. And he goes, I'm going to send the tapes out to Alex Ferguson, and we're going to go that route. I was just young and naive at that point. And I said, uh, sure, you know. And sure enough, uh, um, about less than a month later, um, I was brought back into the office and Gordon Hill, myself and Alex Ferguson, we had a conference call, a chat, and basically they had invited me uh, on trial to be with Man United. And at that time, Ryan Giggs was just one year uh, under his belt with Man United. So at that time, I didn't even know who Ryan Giggs was. Uh, and really the soccer world didn't really know who Ryan Giggs was. So he, he was this you know, first year player at Man United. Um, but what Sir Alex, Fer well, we call him now Sir Alex Ferguson, but mm -hmm. at the time, Alex Ferguson, what he really wanted to do there at the organization was he wanted to set up uh, an environment where the players can be challenged, where um, players could be fighting for positions. And he thought that that would be a healthy environment to keep the team uh, at the top level. So he felt that by me coming over there, that I can create that with Ryan Giggs, that we have two left-sided players that right. could be battling for first-team position. And, and he even told me straight out, he goes, you know, he had a good season, you know, but he goes, you know, from what I've seen on the tapes, you're doing a fantastic job as well. So, um, you know, he proposed the pitch to me that, you know, um, if you're good enough, we'll sign you with the first team. But even if we don't sign you to the first team, that, you know, we can look to have you with the reserves and then you can, you know, you know, fight your way and, and try to get onto that first team. So um, the invite was there. We were ready to go. And even Gordon Hill, after the call, um, we, we had kept it very private. Uh, the only people that really knew what was going on was, um, you know, the, the inside people in the organization and including some of the head brass from the Canadian Soccer League. We really kept it hush-hush at that time about me going over. And even Gordon said uh, to me, you know, for, with him being a former player, even if I didn't, uh, you know, if I, if I never really made the first team and, and things didn't really go well at Man United, the fact that you're in that camp and you're That's in right. that environment, that you can basically pick and choose after that, which whatever club you want to go to in England at that point, because because they knew how their their um, academy system works there, they know how the player development works there. So you can basically walk into any other organization and basically say, "I came from Man United." So that was the whole plan. But that's when I first tore my ACL 
uh, in a game against the Hamilton Steelers uh, at Brian Timmons Stadium. Um, I was two weeks away going uh, for my trial, and I tore my ACL. So all of those hopes and uh, aspirations to go to Man United um, were were out the door at that point. Um, so how and did so, Aston Villa come in? David? And Aston Villa came in later on. So when I went through that whole uh, injury bug uh, at that time, so at that time when I tore my ACL, it was just a partial ACL tear. So I played the 92 season in the Canadian Soccer League, um, you know, basically playing with, you know, a half a leg, um, you know, and I was getting multiple episodes with the knee. Um, you know, kind of giving out on me from time to time. Um, but I was still able to play um, with that. And that's when I initially had my first call-up to be with the Men's World Cup team. There were two exhibition games being played on the East Coast in, in St. John's against the Americans. So um, at, the, at, at that time, uh, we were entering the playoffs. I wasn't um, 100% with my knee. So I basically uh, spoke to Bobby Landerduzzi and we basically nixed that whole uh, opportunity for me to play my first cap games when I was 19 years old with the men's team. Um, Montreal got eliminated from the playoffs. And at that point, that's when I had decided enough was enough. And I ended up getting the ACL reconstruction uh, in the winter fall of 92. So I went through that whole rehab stint uh, right through 93. So 93 was a write-off year for me. I didn't do much at that point. And then when it came to the 94 year, that's when uh, Gordon Hill and his, his brass basically pitched the, the notion of me going to um, Glasgow Rangers and to Aston Villa. And so I went to Glasgow Rangers first, had a very good stint there. And then after that, um, I went to Aston Villa. The only reason I went to Aston Villa was because the trial was already arranged ahead of time. So when I was with the Rangers, they actually wanted me to stay back and, and be with the reserve and youth team to continue training with them. Because the first team at that time, uh, they were in Champions League. And so they had a tour in Italy, and I couldn't play uh, or travel with them at that time. I wasn't even signed or anything of that nature. So Walter Smith, who was the manager at the time, um, had heard a lot of good things about me. He didn't see me play yet. He saw me in the training sessions, but he still didn't really see me um, fully at that point. And, and their trip to Italy had just occurred while I was already there for less than a week. So they had asked me to stay behind, which I did. But then at that same point, my trial with Aston Villa was coming up. And so the Rangers couldn't make a decision on me until Walter Smith and the first team came back. So at that time, we had sat down with the youth and reserve coaches, John McGregor and Billy Kirkwood. Um, and so they basically had said, we understand your situation. We really enjoy the fact of what you've been doing here. We would like you to stay but we totally understand that you need to also look for, you know, a, a contract. Mm. So I ended up going to Aston Villa as planned uh, as part of my trial, uh, as part of my trial. And it was at that time when I had arrived at the campgrounds and I still will never forget this. I walk into the change room and, you know, when you're coming in, whether as a trialist or just this new player, and you're walking in, sometimes the reception is not going to be very toasty, right? Your players are going to be looking at you. Who's this guy? You know, where's he coming from? And that's how it first felt when I first walked in, that first maybe 20, 30 seconds. But Dwight York had recognized me. And so what happened that's was he actually – That's uh, from the, the welcome button. That's right. He remembered me from the international games that we played against one another. And he actually came up and he embraced me and he turned around to his team and he said, you know, this is the Canadian guy. I know who he is. And, you know, he's a good player and a good baller. And right away at that moment, the players in the change room basically embraced me and they, you know, in a way they accepted me. And so, you know, at that time I was, you know, training with the team. And in fact, because of all that, 
they ended up inviting me with the the first team. They were they were going out uh, night on the town type of thing mm -hmm. uh, a few nights later, and they had asked me if I wanted to join them, which I did. So um, it, it it started out there. So and and at that time, Dwight York still wasn't a, a regular on the first team. He was still was battling. Yeah, he was still with the with the reserve team trying to get up to the first team. So he still wasn't, uh, you know, a staple at Aston Villa. You know, he, he made his mark with Aston Villa right afterwards. And I came into the organization uh, on my trial where, um, you know, for those English fans that will remember, Aston Villa had actually beaten Man United in the 1994 um, Coca-Cola uh, Cup. So Aston Villa was coming up, uh, coming off this big, a cup championship and and then here I was stepping in uh you know uh during that time period sorry it was 93 or 94 they had beaten man united i believe 3-2 um and then i came in in that 94 season to basically uh join them on trial so it was kind of it was 94 it was in the in the uh around i think it was like may you know near the end of the season they had beat man united in the cup mm -hmm. game 3-2 yeah. And then I was there on trial that summer. So everything was fresh. You know, er, you know Astonville was on a high. Uh, everything was, was going well there. And, you know, and I remember at the time um, when I was picked up at the airport, um, the manager for Aston Villa at the time, Jim Barron, he was the one who had said to me, you know, you know, we've got this Trini player here, you know, uh, Dwight York, he's doing well, you know, and, you know, we're looking at him, you know, first team and, you know, he was asking me, do you know who he is? I'm like, of course I know who he is. You know, we played <laughs> against each other many times. And, um, and yeah, and then it rolled from there, from the change room, um, you know, embracing me. And then from there on in, um, you know, uh, playing the, the matches that I, that I did with Aston Villa at that time. Um, unlikely, I did not uh, get an offer. And a lot of it stemmed from me just uh, leaving the, the trial at that time. Mm -hmm. I ended up picking up an injury um uh, on my calf so i had this really bad contusion i had already played two games with aston villa and i had scored two goals with them um and so um, yeah so everything was looking good you know at that time yeah i'd scored two goals one game against chelsea um we we tied one one and then the other game was against uh bolton wanderers and uh, we had won that game two one and i had scored a goal in that game as well so um, you know, everything was going well. And then in one of the training sessions, I just ended up getting uh, cleated at the back of my calf. And I was basically out for, you know, a lengthy time period. And we just knew that things were not getting healed and wasn't getting any better. So uh, we decided to leave the camp because there was no point for me to, to hang around mm -hmm. with an injury. Um, and so we actually made our way back to the Rangers camp. And I was there uh, again. Uh, they were just waiting for me to see if I would get better. Um, it wasn't the case, um, and so I ended up uh, flying home. And and it wasn't until that point I didn't really fully recover from that calf injury until oh about four or six weeks after I arrived home back in Toronto. So this this injury took me a good couple of months to to get back. And at that time, that's when I had enrolled into my um, into my university, uh, you know, going, going to university. And then as soon as I was, um, you know, enrolled in university and, and now we're talking the month of like uh, November and I ended up getting a call again uh, from Gordon Hill. And he basically said, are you, in are you interested in going to England again? And there's some interest from Leicester city and from Sheffield uh, Wednesday. And at that time, I, I turned down the, the offer and only because I, you know, that summer for me, I, it was, a, I, again, I felt like I was in a, in a bit of a rut. I felt a little bit disappointed um, that I had gone down there. I had uh, showed well and, you know, and then I picked up this calf injury. And so, uh, you know, and I had just enrolled in, into university and I had already started my studies that, you know, for me to kind of uh, put everything aside, yeah, um, yeah. that I, I just wasn't really up for it at that point. And we were going to maybe revisit that the following year. Well, then the following year is when I signed with Montreal. And then I did 
what I did at the Carabana tournament. Um, so, and, so, so let's, let's, let's um, fast forward a little bit. So sure. you made the under 19. Yep. That must have helped you coming into the Carabana Cup in those it, youth programs. It, it definitely did because uh, at those uh, CONCACAF championships, you know, playing internationally, and it didn't have to be against Trinidad and Tobago. Um, every single match that was being played, they were 10, 15, 20, 25,000 fans. So as a youngster, you really got used to playing in front of large crowds um, and, you know, and hearing the, the, the drums beating and hearing the shouting and the chanting and the music being played throughout the match. You know, as much as, you know, that they, they're doing that for the entertainment purpose of it, of it, they're also, you know, when you're listening to this music and stuff like that, you would think that, you know, are, are you losing the focus? And a lot of times, you know, you, and again, I was young, but you learn very quickly how to try to drown out all of that noise so that you can focus and channel all your attention to what you need to do out there on the field. So it really does become almost like, you know, uh, it's a, like a, you know, you block everything out and all you really hear is, I mean, you can hear a little bit of the, the noise and the music in the background, but really you're, you're just hearing the players on the field shouting and the instructions that are being given, the referees whistle, and you really drown out a lot of the other noise that's happening beyond that. Um, so you, you had to learn very quickly, so, you know, about playing in front of these large crowds. Right. Where from the under 19 that they start, is it the same progression now to go to the senior team? It was kind of the same progression. So it, it started afterwards uh, between uh, the under 60 national and, team. And and just, let me, just let me let the, the, the public understand. Sure. The senior team that we want to put them on is the Carabana Cup. We all know as West Indians what the Carabana Cup is. We, we want to come into that. So we get this history of coming in, go through playing left, left back, um, to make it in the under-19. Um, going down to Trinidad and Tobago in the under-16. So now you, you seem like you had a jump start now when it comes to going into that Carabana Cup, which was between Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago. Because now you, you, had, you had a little taste. Um, did that help you with the tournament in any way? Or it was strictly just ball and having your game together? Well, I mean, it was a part of uh, both, actually, you know, ball and having your game together. But it was, a, you know, a little bit of a nostalgic, um, you know, uh, situation for me and, and, and that setting. So um, as much as, you know, the, the pro Jamaican and pro Trinidad fans were at that game, because that's how it was back then. When you were a Canadian international, you know, it's not like what we are seeing today, where it's 25, 30,000 pro Canadian fans that are rooting this current Canadian team. So being the MVP of the Carabana Cup and a big part of your career, lighting up the scoreboard twice the uh, braces in both games. Um, is it regardless of the fans being outnumbered, parents, fans there, home field for you, what's the edge? Or you were just in form and you felt you can, you can hit the net at any time, at any given moment? Um, you know, it, when, I, when I look back at the match, and I, I still remember, even to this day, it, 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 it's ingrained in me. It, it, it bugs me because uh, even though I scored two goals in each match, I really could have had three or four. I had some chances there where, uh, when in hindsight, I was like, if I would have just taken the touch to bring it down, I could have had myself a third goal or, you know, if, if I would have just hit that ball and, and had a little bit more patience and been a little bit more calm in that situation, I could have walked that ball in and, and scored another goal. So the Carabana Cup, you know, this is something in the community, something I'm going to highlight in, in the magazine. And um, it's an honor to have you on as the MVP of the Carabana Cup. I just want to ask you this. Yes. Seeing that you went through all that, what did your wife and family think? How were they coping with you having these ups and downs? How, how, how did that work? Well, I mean, at that, at that point, um, you know, my, my family was just always um, very supportive in all of this. Um, they, they knew I had a, also a good head on my shoulders. 
And I also had, um, you know, I had a backup plan as well. And so that's why uh, at the times when I was going through my initial, um, you know, ACL injuries, um, I had been accepted at the University of Toronto. And so at that point, I, I had made that decision that, you know, while I'm at home rehabbing, I might as well do some schooling. So injuries... For some reason, I met you down at GS and, and you were off the national scene then. And I, I did a little quick flow through and I realized injuries you were having your little run in with injuries. How that worked for you and then you end up at GS. And to me, that was a big welcome into the community to have players at your level, your brother level, and a lot of players at your caliber came into that circuit and raised the level of the amateur game. And how you well we end up in GS and how you got to GS? Um, basically, 96, 97, right through to 2000, 2001, I was in and out of operating tables throughout that whole entire That's time. Tough. So when That's we talk tough. about, yeah, it was tough. And not just for me physically, but emotionally, um, you know, trying to, to get back. And then you always had setbacks and then you're back in the operating table. I went through a, a big spurt there where instead of me, you know, basically owning my skills on the field, I, I, I'm dealing with rehab and visiting doctors. So it took a while and I, I ended up getting back and I was playing in the CPSL with the Vaughn Sun Devils. Um, I remember playing Metro Lions, yep. you know, back then yep. they had a very good team. Um, you know, a few players on my team, uh, Elvis Thomas, uh, Bayati Smith were teammates of mine, uh, playing, you know, with uh, Vaughn Sun Devils. I think what's his name in the back to um, T. Marshall? T. Marshall, yes. T. Marshall was also there with us yeah. uh, playing on the Vaughn Sun Devils. Um, if, I'm trying to remember, I believe even for a short stint, we had um, – um, Westmass, Jonathan Westmass yes. was with us yes. for, very briefly at that time. So, you know, we, ha we had a lot of players, you know, from, you know, the, the Caribbean descent that were on that Von Sun Devils team, you know, guys who, I, you know, I, I still communicated. So nice. You fit in smoothly, man. You, 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 you one of us, man. Yeah. And then GS later literally came in um, right after that. So I ended up joining GS in 2003. And at that time, my best friend, uh, Paul Stoyanovsky, we call him Pepe. Uh, again, a lot of people in GS know who Pepe is. Um, he played with me on Scarborough Maple Leafs, a great player. And he basically had told me, listen, there's nowhere else to go look for. Don't go play for this team or that team. Play with GS. You know, uh, Dave Sadu takes care of the players very well here. Um, it's a, a very good camaraderie. The guys get along. A lot of the boys are from Scarborough, Scarborough-based boys. Um, you're going to like it here. And the fact that we also had played GS in previous years. Now, we're talking when I was like 19, 20 years of age, you know, playing at Scarborough clearly in the indoor leagues. Mm -hmm. We would always play against GS, uh, you know, in big matches and stuff like that. So we were familiar, sorry, with the, with the players. And so – Pep just told me, play with GS. If you want, I can talk to Johnny Williams and we can take it from there. And that was, that was it. Johnny contacted me. I spoke to Johnny first. Um, then uh, we spoke to Dave Sadu and Dave Sadu, you know, uh, embraced me with open arms. And he just loved the fact of having uh, someone from, let's say, a different uh, background, a different perspective, um, someone he felt that a lot of these players knew who I was and that I could bring uh, that leadership and that experience that may have been kind of uh, preventing the GS team from getting over the hump because th at that time GS was always a quarterfinal team you know they can never get past the quarterfinals of the Ontario Cup and so they were hoping that, you know, with the addition of myself and a few others, we can get over that hump. Did you, did you, did you have a talk with, with Dave? Because if you're going into GS, somewhere in there, who's not your caliber, mm -hmm. we'd have a... Yes, oh, definitely. So when, when I first, yeah, so if we're going to go back there, it's ironic that it, uh, you even bring this up to it. Now, Dave Sadu, for those who don't know Dave, Dave is a man of honor. He's also a man where he is... He, he does not want to win 
with a team or a personnel that is going to be a type of team that's disrespectful on the field, where there's a bunch of problems, bunch of egos. He would rather lose with top quality uh, stand-up individuals as opposed to winning with guys who are going to be red cards, yellow cards, causing trouble, all of that. Yeah. So, um, that's, so that's the family atmosphere. And that's the family atmosphere. And that was one thing that he told me. He said, you're going to like it here. The players know who you are. You know who they are. This is um, the type of vision that I have for this team. And I've never won the Ontario Cup. And that's one trophy that I would like to win. And I still remember telling Dave, um, at that moment, I said, Dave, forget about the Ontario Cup. I'm just telling you this straight out because I've won the Ontario Cup so many times. I'm going to help you win that Ontario Cup. I go, I'm going to tell you one better. We're going to win the national championship with this team while I'm here. And I just remember his, his, just his voice on the phone was like, I would love to see it. Like, it was like nostalgia. It was like almost like, wow, like I'm hearing him say something very confidently, but I hope it could come to fruition. So when we won it in 2005, uh, you know, on our way back uh, from the, the field after we won the national championships, you know, all the players kind of went around and were kind of just telling their stories of how they joined GS and what it meant to win with GS and I brought up that story to Dave and I said, Dave, do you remember what I told you a few years ago in that conversation? And he said, I still remember that conversation and what you said. He was emotional. I was emotional. Yeah, and even for me, it was very emotional because, um, you know, especially with all the setbacks I had. And even though I, you know, I had a, you know, a good career and a successful career, this was for me my first major championship after everything that had happened to me ended up being the top goal scorer of the tournament uh, with five goals. Um, but I ended up having seven assists. So out of the 15 goals that we had scored, I was in on 12 of those 15 yeah. goals. Yeah. So it was for me a really, uh, you know, a coming out, uh, you know, kind of situation leagues. So, so let, me, let me think this, although I hear the, what you're saying, I hear you're a tough player. I hear um, you're really tough. I, I'm, I've, I've got a backbone. Let's just say I've got a backbone. And, and I feel like, you know, with everything that's happened, um, yeah, there was a lot of um, built-up um, anger. There was a lot of built-up animosity at, at one point. Um, but there was a lot of grit and perseverance that happened uh, through that. And so, you know, when there were those games where, you know, everything was on the line and the tough got going and you really needed to grind out a victory or to pull out, uh, you know, a rabbit out of the hat, as they call it, you know, I was that player where I always would tell my teammates, give me the ball because I'm going to find a way to put the ball in the back of the net because of what I've gone through. You know, no one understands what I've gone through. So that national career you had, and looking at the Canadian team now, um, I see a lot of write-up of, you know, um, they can't forget, you have the Dwayne's, you have you guys and stuff. Um, what do you think of, um, obviously it was a successful campaign. Did you think you would ever see Canada being number one in CONCACAF through our qualifying? Being number one. Um, I'll be honest with you. Um, no. Um, but did I think that we had the potential to qualify for a World Cup? I've always echoed this, even from my playing days and, and even, even after my stints with the national team. You know, I, I missed out on opportunities of, of being uh, a teammate with, with Dero. I missed out on playing with Atiba on the men's team and, you know, and the likes of Paul Saltieri on the men's team. Even though I played with Dwayne and Paul Saltieri with the Toronto Lynx, it's different, right? Um, 
So there were campaigns with these teams and Adrian Saru, you know, being with the, with the men's team. You know, I'm, I'm throwing a lot of Caribbean names out there, players mm -hmm. from that background. Um, you know, I was teammates with Lyndon Hooper, you know, with that GS championship team. But I was also teammates with him on the Montreal Impact. Um, so why am I saying this is because, um, you know, there were teams after me, even though, you know, I went through that whole injury bug, where I legitimately thought that, you know, with Dwayne there and Atiba there and, you know, and um, Stalteri and Julian de Guzman. Atiba, you know, that, uh, Adi Guba. Da, da, yeah, you know, that I thought that this Canadian team, um, you know, back in those days would have qualified for a World Cup, you know, with, with the likes of Ian Hume and all of them. Mm -hmm. and, and they didn't, right? And, and I always would say this for me. With the country that we live in and with the different diverse backgrounds and cultures and there's just for me, there's just no way that we cannot produce a team of 11 or 18 or, or a pool of 25 players where we cannot gain uh, and be a part of the three spots in CONCACAF. And it's a different generation. This is a totally different makeup team. But at the same time, we've got to be realistic of, like, who they're playing here. You know, yeah. they're playing Belgium, uh, World Giants. You know, they're playing a, a Croatian team that is very tough. Um, so they're going to have their hands full here. For me, what I'm, I'm, I'm you know, for me, where I, I think that their, even their opportunities will be limited. And, and that's because uh, we, we know that the ball possession is going to be dominated by Belgium. Yeah. We know that the ball possession is going to be dominated by Croatia. Uh, that's just a given. That's the whole. They're just at a different level. Mm -hmm. So they're going to hold the ball possession for the majority of the game. Times when they don't, yes, we, we are hoping that the Canadian team might catch them somewhere and capitalize with their speed on a counterattack. I get all that. But these teams also know, and they've researched our Canadian team. They know Davies. Yes. They yes. know Richie Larea. They know David. They know Laren. We do in CONCACAF is one thing, you know, where we can put pressure on the on these back lines. We can look to try to make uh, get their back lines to make mistakes right across the pitch and, and look to capitalize with our speed. But, you know, when we get to the World Cup, mm -hmm. this is going to be a, a totally different puppy. And I, and I mentioned this briefly before. You know, they know that we have Davies. They know we have Laren and David. And, you know, and we have a, a, a good crop of players there who are playing in Europe and who are seasoned veterans and pros. But as, as, as still, as a whole, you know, we still have players on this team that, you know, and in no disrespect, or they're not playing with the top teams in the world. They're playing a Belgium team where every single player is not just yeah. playing in a top league, but they're playing with some of the best teams yeah. in the world, yeah. right? And these guys are seasoned vets, and they have been around the block. You yeah, know, this Belgian team has had a lot of expectations, and but they have been in many tournaments. So that experience is also plays into this. So um, will the Canadian team be ready and prepared? Absolutely. Herdman will have these guys ready and prepared. Have to have but it's team. one thing to be prepared and ready. And then when you actually step on the field and then you look around and you see who you're facing and who you're matching up, I think it might be a little bit of a, of a shell shock and maybe a little bit of a reality check at that point unless I, unless we underestimate in how tight if they really let me tell you something about sport if they really as tight as they're showing there's a certain cockiness to begin with that we can do it yeah. and i seen it in buchanan right i seen it in, in davies because davies not only tough davies feel he can always break through i think the midfield has to save the day and you know, do, do I obviously want the Canadian team to do well? Absolutely we do. We, we don't want to be there and and um, we have all of these high expectations. It's, and it becomes where, you know, uh, it, the worst case scenario would be zero points and not another goal. You know, yeah. that would yeah. be for me yeah, catastrophic with this team. I don't think that... I don't think it's the same. I don't think so either. Um, 
but you know our our team even though we won first place um again just to kind of remind the viewers a little bit here this is CONCACAF we still lost some games you know near the end there these now these elements are we're not playing at the ice teca you know yeah, yeah. where you know we, we in the qualifying round we you know we're we're a very good team but we're not world beaters it, let's be honest yeah, you know yeah, we, yeah. we we still lost games in CONCACAF during the world cup qualification we didn't run the table we weren't you know what was it 14 and 0 we weren't 14 yeah. and 0 so what i'm trying to say now is that Playing teams in CONCACAF and now playing against world-class teams like Belgium so and, and Croatia, I even though they're a little bit true. older, it's, go, it's still, it's still going to be very, very, very tough. That means you have to stay with it all the time. You have to think it all the time. You have to work towards it all the time. Of you have the system in place. See, that's why you have to give Hoodman credit. You, you do. And, and listen, I was one of those uh, people when they first announced him as the coach, we all knew what he did with the women's team. Um, and it was, it was amazing. Right. But the question was, is could he now do that with the men's team? It's a whole different puppy. And, uh, and it, we know very well that it, would this fly in any other European country? No, where, no it, it would just never be even thought about. So the fact that we, we in Canada uh, did this, a, a lot of the purists thought, are they nuts? Like, are you serious? Like, we're not saying he's not a good coach, but you know, that's, he was coaching a women's team. Can he, he can he do that with the men's I, team? I was like, there in the press conference and I was watching it turn over from the women's in the press conference. Well, he's, he, he's, he's a passionate guy. So you have yeah. to give him room to see if he can do it. Yes. And so I, again, I was, I was skeptical at first. But when I really changed, um, you know, my outlook on this team was um, even even prior to the Gold Cup. I remember the Canadians had some uh, good spells and good matches against the U.S. national team here at BMO. But uh, it was really that Gold Cup when, um, you know, I started to see things even just from watching on TV. Um, you know, when the camera would show the team kind of in a group setting or when Herdman would be talking. I wasn't, obviously we don't know what he's saying to the players. We can are, kind of have an idea what he's yeah, saying. Yeah, as well as you know, player, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you have an idea of what he's saying. But what I was honestly paying attention to was the player's eyes. Were they channeled in? Were they tuned in? Are they focused? Are they in line with what this coach is saying? And the answer was yes. Like mm -hmm. this team Thank was you. channeled in and you can tell from that gold cup that for me was when I started to see, um, you know, not only Davies is starting to come around, but I started to see the likes of Buchanan, you know, this young player yes. coming out of nowhere, yes. you know, Buchanan. and it was that like, was who is up. this kid, you know, and then you would see the style and the flair. And then, and then it was even the way they were playing. It was, it was, um, it, they looked like, and this is no knock against any previous national teams, but the way they played and the style they played, you would be watching on TV saying, wow, these boys know how to knock a ball around. Yes. That there is no discrepancy here between Canada and Mexico. I don't see, you know, this, um, you know, one team looks way more dominant than the other. This team can compete and run against and, and battle against some of their best players. We had fit, fast, technical, good players right across the board. And that, for me, that Gold Cup um, really was a wake-up call. And I remember even Richie Larea. There was one play mm -hmm. where uh, the Mex it was a tackle and they were both getting up and the Mexican player had just, like, pushed uh, Richie you know, and Richie turned around and gave him a shove back and basically got in his face. And then Buchanan jumped in. And I was like, wow, the camaraderie that's there. And these boys are basically putting up a front that we're here and we're not disappearing. No, boy, that's, that's, that's and you right. better get used to us because we're going to be here in CONCACAF, not just for this gold cup, but you're going to see us around for the next five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years. It was just that front that they had 
I was like, wow, this Canadian team is not going to get bullied around anywhere around the pitch. And it was beautiful to see that. And I think that is from that gold cup, that filtered on into these into this World Cup qualification where this team I, I, felt confident I, I, I that they the can do now. things. I want to put you on the spot now. You sure. don't have to go too deep on the spot or you don't have to go long in the hole. Okay. I mean, Qatar. Um, okay. I just put the groups together. I have the pictures of the groups together and stuff. Um, I'm pretty familiar with the World Cups and at that level. What do you think? I still think that they have their, their um, it's going to be a, a tough group for them. Um, you know, we always hear, yeah, Belgium is aging a bit. Uh, Croatia is, is aging a bit as well. And maybe this might be our time with the Canadian team to get through in this round. Um, we've got a chance against Morocco. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of torn here a little bit because there's one side of me that says I, I could see this Canadian team possibly getting through in this group, but it, it's not going to be easy still. Um, you know, what, we're, we're still talking about Belgium here, you know, who for the most part was number one ranked for like the longest time. And they're still in the top two or three in the and, world. And they're in the, in the semifinals all the time, the last Exactly. Month. And and then you've got Croatia where, yeah, okay, they're, they're aging. Um, but they were just in the World Cup final four years ago. You know, this is not a team that is just going to, you know, our Canadian team is just going to show up. And, yeah, we're young and we're fast and we're fit. And we've talked about all this. But this Croatian team carries a lot of experience. You know, this – Belgian team, uh, we're talking about world class players. Yeah, you know, our, our midfield, it, you know, as you know, Ustakio and you know, and K and the rest of the group there. Yes, they, you know, they they have played internationally and they've played against some very good ballers and you know, in their careers, but they will never have played against you know, the likes of De Bruyne, you know, in the in mm-hmm. the in the midfield. Right. So they're they're going to quickly get, um, you know, uh, a little bit of dose of reality, a little bit of shell shock. Um, you know, will they be able to compete? Absolutely. Um, but will I think that they will win against Belgium. If I was a betting man, my answer would be no. Um, so then that carries us over to the next game against Croatia. Croatia. Do I see them beating Croatia? I don't know. Uh, there's a part of me that says I think that they could get maybe a tie there, possibly a win, maybe. But I, I'm still leaning towards a tie or a loss. My main thing for this Canadian team, because it's the first time that we have been there since 86, is let's not maybe jump too far and too ahead too soon. Um, we didn't score in 86 and I get it that this is a totally different team, but let's focus on scoring our first goal. And I think that's, what's going to set the tempo for this team. If they can score the first goal goal in that first match against Belgium, then this team is going to feel confident and they're going to be energized and who knows what can happen from them. But if they end up, and I'm just giving an example, if they end up losing that first match against Belgium, 1-0, 2-0, 3-0, I'm just throwing mm-hmm. results here. That means they still haven't scored. Now they're going into the second match, you know, without a goal. A little bit of pressure will mount on them. And the question is, is will they be able to get a result against the Croatian team? Now, mind you, we also have to remember the first games. Croatia is playing Morocco in that first game. Croatia may have the win under their belt at that point. Mm-hmm. So the stakes are high for Croatia, right? Mm-hmm. They, they could literally come out of that group and, and be first place after the second game because they will play the third game against Belgium, right? So yeah. if we assume that Belgium will then beat Morocco, you've got Belgium and Croatia technically – either both sitting at six points, right? Mm. Or you can have Belgium sitting at six points. And I'm just saying again, let's say the Canadian team ties Croatia. 
Then you've got Croatia sitting at four points. So going into the third match, Canada and Morocco are essentially out of the group, right? Yeah. They're not going to advance. Yeah. So, you know, what will they do in that third match? Well, we don't know what Herdman might do in that third match. If the Canadian team is knocked out by that point, if Morocco is knocked out... He's going to give people some, some, some time. Exactly. He's going to start giving some playing time. He's probably already going to think about four years down the road when we co-host it, that he might want to give some of these players that experience yeah. and, uh, and give them a run. In, that's in normally, that. that's the normal. That's normal. That's normal. So, you know, I, I think the focus should be is, you know, let's take one game at a time here. You know, the, the focus is let's go out there and really play strong and aggressive against Belgium. Could we get that first goal there? Because if they can get that first goal, then I think that that can create a lot of not only excitement, but confidence to these players. But if this game drags on where they don't score in the first game, and then we don't know what will happen against Croatia, and I'm just saying, if they don't score against Croatia, all of a sudden, you know how the media plays it out. Is this Canadian team going to be able to score a goal and get over that that you know to be honest with you, to get although, a goal. although your assessment is on the button and i believe I, i i know the goal is the most important if they get the goal in the first game they could create some problems even yeah, to yes. belgium right because yeah. if you know the personnel if you know these guys how they play the buchanan and them then if if they if belgium may makes a mistake and canada scores that world cup is is going to be different Yes. Canada is unpredictable. I'm telling yeah. you. Yeah. I, I and all wouldn't be able to predict them because I know. So it's strange. And it's, it's, you know what you're talking about. And I don't think it's because you're a goal scorer or whatever, because I, I'm a scorer too. But that is so important because you have to look at what our signature was in 86. Yeah. And, and that's what Trinidad and Tobago's signature was in 2006. What it does, you play well, you hold England late, you hold this one late, but at the end of the day, were you adequate enough that you couldn't score a goal in the World Cup? That's right. That's, that loomed large. Yeah. That's, and they need to break that cycle. Yeah. And, I, and this team's got the potential to score to the goals. We've got, we've got players there who can put the ball. I would be surprised if that team gets shut out. I, I would be surprised as well. I, I don't see them being shut out. I, I, I honestly believe that I see at least one or two goals possibly coming out of this team. Um, uh, anything above and beyond that is just going to be the icing on the cake. Because if they do that, I mean, they're going to get through in this group. Um, but I, I do see this team score, scoring. Um, and, you know, whether they will win their matches is, is another story. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking that they can maybe get one or two goals out of this group. Enough where they will at least maybe get some points. Maybe they draw yeah. somewhere, yeah. or maybe they, oh, they win a match, a close draw. match, yeah. one nil or two one. They might they might be able to muster something like that. Um, but you know we we are going to be prepared for these teams. We we also know that the personnel that these European teams have and the coaching and so on. Um, they they know who Davies is. Well, let me ask. Um... Based on that now, um, do you think the squad is going to remain the same? I'll put in your, as I say, I dig a little nice pigeonhole for you. Do you think the, any personnel change going into Qatar? Going into Qatar? Um, I, 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 don't know. I don't think there'll be any major changes here. I mean... This is the team that brought us here, right? So, you know, that same philosophy, why, why do you want to, you know, rock the boat when it doesn't need to be rocked, right? Um, they got us here for a reason. And so when you talk about, uh, again, camaraderie is a big thing, right? These players are all familiar with one another. They've created this special bond. Herdman and, and the staff there Um, have done a great job. Moro Biello, the assistant coach, is a, a, a former teammate of mine. We played together on the youth national teams. We played together in Montreal. We had stints together on the men's team. I know what they bring to the table as well. Great individuals. They will have this team prepared. Um, and, and this is the group that they selected 
that they felt could get us to Qatar. So the question is, is why would you want to change things? I get it that some players are are getting a little bit older, but I really think that the only change that you may potentially make going into Qatar is just for the mere fact if if someone is just not fit and ready to play. They, they pick up an injury and they just can't go. Um, then that's a le- legitimate reason. But I don't think that you're in a situation right now, um, you know, I, I don't want to say it's about being fair or not. Uh, there's, there is no honest, you know, there is no loyalty and there's no fairness in, in any sport. But I think in this situation, you know, this is the team that brought us here. And so those players deserve uh, that opportunity to be in Qatar. I think the only changes that you may possibly make is, again, if someone picks up an injury and they simply cannot go and they got to bring in a new, a new body and a new face. But obviously four years from now, uh, you know, we're not going to see this same particular team. We're going to see the majority of these guys. But what I'm excited to see is the next batch of young crop that's coming through. Some of them have already been displayed on this men's team. But what is coming down the channel, you know, is going to excite me. You know, when you've got players who now play in the CPL, uh, some young, talented players that we probably don't even know of, right? Yeah. There's kids right now who are 18 years of, old, uh, of age, 19 years of age, 17 years of age, that they might be in the Canadian system or they may not be. But they're going to make some type of splash over the next two or three years, and it could be these guys who are going to be a part of this core group moving into, uh, you know, into the World Cup when we host it. And I even look at it even beyond that, because we also know moving forward when we're going to, um, if I'm not mistaken, it's either 2030 or 2034, FIFA is going to open up the tournament to to be even larger, which means there's going to be more spots coming out of CONCACAF. So we all know that right now it has always been three with a chance of the fourth team to get through in the, in the, in the back end. Yeah. But going in the future, if they do decide that they're going to open up the tournament to more teams being in the World Cup, that means there's going to be a lot more CONCACAF spots. So who knows what that table is going to look like down the road. It could be four or possibly five automatic berths to get to those World Cups. Yeah. So the chances of our Canadian team getting to those world cups. Um, I mean, and then it obviously it, it, it opens up everything for all the other CONCACAF nations, like teams like, you know, Jamaica or Trinidad and Tobago or Panama, or, you know, those nations are going to be there going, geez, you know, it's not just three plus the fourth spot. Now we have a chance to maybe get that fourth or fifth spot and be in an automatic berth. So when I look at it from the Canadian standpoint, man, we've got a great opportunity here for a very, very, very long time of being in the World Cup all the time. And I think that is something that would be great. Well, um, Tom, I want to thank you for giving me the time. But before we go, um, what's in the, in, are you in the field? Are you, and the last time I saw you, you were doing the, the coaching serious delighting and stuff. Are you coaching what you're doing? Or I see a lot of pictures here from real family man uh, went through your yeah. thing, which is nice. I mean, I realize you take that very seriously, which is having the right head on. Um, so what do you do in terms of your time? Are you coaching or anything? Um, I, w- I was coaching for a number of years um, uh, down at Markham Soccer Club with two OPDL teams. Um, but those teams uh, eventually graduated in terms of their age and stuff like that. Um, and I basically, uh, gave myself a bit of a break. Um, and you know, I, I had two, you know, two young kids as well at that time. Um, so now, you know, my daughter's 10, uh, she's playing rep soccer. My son is eight. He's playing, you know, rep soccer, uh, does a little bit of hockey as well, but, um, I'm, I'm just being the, the parents who's just enjoying them watching them. I'm like any other parent, you know, I bring my, you know, my lawn chair out, I bring my Tim Hortons coffee, and I'm just there to watch them, you know, just have a smile on their face and enjoy the game. 
um, you know, from time to time, I'm, 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 I'm asked by sometimes the coaches to, to help out, you know, coaching here, or can you be on the sideline for, for some of the games and stuff like that? You know, and I'm more than welcome to do that, but you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in a, you know, uh, in a position now in my, um, in my life where, you know, I, I'm really busy with my work. I'm, I'm, you know, with my family and the kids growing up, you know, I just really want to just enjoy it. I, I've done a lot of coaching over the years. You know, when we look back at, you know, after the Carabana tournament, that's when I really started to just get into coaching. So since 95, 96, right through to, let's say the last couple of years ago, I've been on and off coaching for, you know, I would say, you know, 25, 26 years of, of coaching, you know, and again, I was coaching, you know, uh, at the University of Toronto, I was an assistant coach, I was coaching, you know, in the CPSL with some of the developmental uh, teams with the Toronto Olympians. I mean, I've, I've coached OPDL. Uh, you know, I've, I've coached, uh, you know, at academies with Gary Miller at Bryce International. I've done a lot of coaching over the years. And a lot of that was for other people, us, us, for, us. Uh, for other kids, right? So now I'm in a situation where could I coach my kids? Would that interest me? Sure. But I, I'm just enjoying watching them and, and letting them hear the instruction and hearing uh, you know, the practices and the lessons from someone else. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I don't want them to feel the pressure of, you know, it's, it's the coach's son or daughter and, and all that stuff. You know, it's, if I give my feedback to the kids, but I really want them to just enjoy it. There's going to be a point in time when they get older, if they really uh, pursue the game or they really like, and they have a passion, I am sure because they know where daddy has played now and where he's been if they are serious about their soccer, if they really want to take it to the next level, they're going to, I'm sure, approach me and say, take me out on the field exactly. and, and show me, yes. you know, I yes. want you to show me yes. all the small little, you know, in, in, intricacies of the game, all the nuances. I want you to show me what it needs to be to get to that next level. And I'll be all open arms at that point. But at this stage, you know, I'm just enjoying watching them and spending that quality time uh, with the kids, uh, family time, you know, and, and doing all that stuff because it sure flies by very fast. Yeah, because I watch um, most of your pictures, you haven't, they seem to be having fun. So you keep it up and I think you have it right. If, if they decide they want to get serious and they probably will come through mom. Could you tell that? Uh, blah, 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 blah. It's probably going to come through mom. So that's good because most of your pictures, you're smiling. You seem to be having fun with your kids. So just keep up, keep that good work up. And um, again, I want to thank you for giving me the time and, um, and for coming in the community and giving us a different style of ball and um, some seriousness, you know? So thank you. All right. So you take care and thanks and stay thank safe. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. All right. And you take care. All right. Okay, bye. Okay.